Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome everyone to the New Jersey Coalition for Financial Education webinar, Making Financial Education Concepts Stick and Putting Learning into Practice. My name is Ryan Berger. I'm a communications associate here. I'm joined by Executive Director Michael Drulis and Darnell Sutton, uh, Community Affairs Specialist for the FDIC. Good afternoon and, and welcome. Ryan, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. I can hear you fine. That's great. Thank you. And we're so glad to have uh, everyone together. Uh, my name is Michael Drulis. I'm the executive director for the New Jersey Coalition for Financial Education. And uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to give, frame our discussion a little bit today and then turn it over to the wonderful speakers that Darnell Sutton has put together for us. The New Jersey Coalition for Financial Education um, is a statewide organization cradle to grave charge of financial literacy to advance financial literacy for all people in New Jersey so they can make the right decisions. The reasons we can have these events and make them free is because of our sustaining premier partner, Affinity Federal Credit Union, and other partners, including the New Jersey Credit Union League uh, and JEA, and, uh, and the kind donations of, of the, our sponsors. If you take a look at our executive leadership team, you'll see uh, Kim Cole, Patricia Burhau, Tracy Rimple, Grant Gallagher, uh, recently retired Dr. O'Neill. Uh, our, our leadership team is made up of, of some of the best and the finest in the field. Our partners include state, corporate, for-profit, non-profit um, entities uh, included, I'm sorry, I apologize, two other members of our board uh, not listed here are Scott Cohen and David Benekorov, um, but we have educators, utilities, everyone who advances financial literacy in the state of New Jersey makes up our organization. And we believe for every soul we train, it touches no less than an additional 100 other lives. And that starts to add up in the hundreds of thousands in, in the work that we've done as an organization. Our webinars are a key part of that. Uh, before COVID, if you were a follower of the coalition, you knew we did webinars regularly. And the topics we cover are very, very important to the challenges of not just the day, but of the moment. And today, making financial education concepts stick, putting learning into practice falls right in line. Can take a moment, you've got to take a moment here and just once again announce uh, the coalition was the coalition of the year of 2019 for Jumpstart because we are a state affiliate for uh, NJ Jumpstart. Lastly, we are people powered. We need practitioners in the field. We need people who know, people who need, people who do. So we invite you to participate, not just as a member in our, uh, in our education offerings, but help us to be a leader in financial education. So I wanna introduce someone today who I, I consider a, a very near and dear leader in this community, a very important person, um, someone that we believe is uh, the reason we're all here today, Darnell Sutton. If you wanna talk about somebody who truly, truly gets her hands dirty, gets in the weeds and does financial literacy the way it needs to be done, that's Darnell Sutton. I've worked with Darnell in the inner city of Atlantic City, in, in, in Newark, in rural parts of the state, everywhere. Darnell is um, just a true leader in financial literacy. And you see she's a community affairs specialist for the FDIC. Um, and she assists in building relationships, collaborative opportunities among financial institutions and other community stakeholders to be responsive to community and economic development needs and opportunities, particularly among low and moderate income and traditional underserved populations and communities. Danelle's current work includes pandemic recovery and economic inclusion activities with straight stakeholders in New Jersey and Delaware. And that's so important more than ever because underserved populations could easily be overlooked in a time of crisis. So Darnell, we appreciate you, we thank you, and I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Michael, for that warm introduction, and good afternoon, everyone. The FDIC is happy to host today's webinar in partnership with the New Jersey Coalition for Financial Education. We have been a member of the coalition for roughly 20 years now, and over the years, we've worked together to provide financial education resources and tools and foster partnerships to make financial education available in local New Jersey communities. Uh, with the passing of uh, recent legislation requiring financial education to be made available in high school to, 
to high school and middle school students. We are coming together today to talk about how to make this education more impactful for students. Research shows that while financial education is one piece of the puzzle, the formation of financial attitudes and behaviors, which commonly occurs during childhood, believe it or not, is an important driver of adult financial outcomes. So today we will hear about uh, ways that banks and other organizations are providing opportunities for students to put learned financial knowledge into practice, helping to establish these positive financial habits. Uh, today's webinar is at full capacity with 100 people participating. We do encourage you to uh, use the chat function throughout the webinar to communicate with each other. And then also, please use the Q&A area to submit questions for the panelists. Uh, we will get to as many questions as possible during the Q&A segment um, towards the end of today's program. So now it's my privilege to introduce our speakers for the first panel discussion on school-based savings programs. In the interest of time, I will not read their full bios, but the bios and contact information will be provided following uh, today's webinar. First, we have Kali Velajos. She is a CRA officer for Community Bank of Mississippi, where she's responsible for four states, which includes 51 branches. Kali also taught junior high and high school for five years prior to joining the bank. We also have Mike Foley, Mike is Assistant Vice President and Assistant Compliance Officer for Reading Cooperative Bank in Massachusetts. He also served as branch manager for the bank's educational branches. And finally, we have Elena Parker. She is Assistant Vice President, Community Reinvestment Officer, and Director of Relationship Banking at First Metro Bank in Alabama. She created and implemented six student-run operated branches in Alabama high schools. Welcome to each of our panelists. We are so happy to have you join us today. Um, and, and to start, you know, I'd like to ask each of you to provide an overview of your respective bank's youth savings programs. And if we could start with Callie, that would be great, followed by Mike and Elena. And now I'll turn it over to Callie. Callie, are you there? Can you hear me? We can now. Hello. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, happy Friday. Um, I would like to thank everyone who was responsible for putting on this webinar, um, especially for giving me the opportunity to speak to uh, on a subject that is very special to me, financial literacy. Um, I agree with you, Darnell. It um, needs to start with the children. And in my presentation, I do have our bank's uh, savings program, so I will um, discuss that um, as part of my presentation. Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Um, the first thing that I um, want to uh, say is that um, your bank needs to um, establish a couple of at least a couple of products, um, both for young and for teens, um, that you would be able to offer before you um, actually embark on a um, financial literacy program in the community. And um, our bank has done that. And the thing I want to say is that both the features and the benefits um, of a savings um, and a, a uh, checking account um, for um, youth uh, and young adults uh, need to be very clear. Um, there needs to be um, limited disclosures. Um, and another thing that um, I, I want to preface and say is that your customer service representatives that actually um, do the opening of the accounts need to be trained um, very well, not only on the uh, naturally on the product, 
but taking a step further and making sure that they understand uh, at times the children that may come to them to open a savings account or a student checking account. This um, may be um, the first member in their family to um, uh, have an account. It's a, it's a big deal. Um, they need to address the child. They need to um, look at the child and uh, treat the child um, as if um, they were um, the biggest customer that would be coming to their, to their bank. Um, the child then begins to understand the importance and to take um, ownership of, of their account. So it's important on the bank side to um, have, an, have products, but also to do a good job of training your frontline people on um, the importance of being um, respectful and um, uh, speaking to the children um, with the uh, utmost um, communication on, on the features and the benefits of the product. Uh, on our team side, we also do a training on our front line for um, the uh, customer service representative and the teller to explain the privilege and the benefits of establishing a bank relationship, what that checking account might mean, and what future doors a bank relationship um, does for uh, that, that student. So I'm just <clears throat> going to, uh, here is our minor savings account. As you can see, we are very, um, <clears throat> uh, our features and our benefits are very clear and easy to understand. Um, on our student checking account, again, limited disclosures, very clear and very um, easy to understand. Um, and then all of our services um, offer, uh, all of our accounts come with the, um, these additional services. So um, I, I wanted to preface it that it's important for your bank to have child-friendly or family-friendly accounts. The one thing that all of our financial literacy program is tied to is a, um, a voucher. With every financial literacy class we do, we present the voucher. Um, and we give um, up families um, the opportunity to um, begin the uh, seed for their um, savings account. And this would be to every, if we address um, a family program, every child in the family um, gets this voucher. So this is a standard um, tool that uh, all um, our financial literacy classes um, get gets tied to. The one, one program that um, is tied with, I think that uh, y'all have seen this with the um, Community um, Financial Bureau, is the Money As You Grow Book Club. But we've taken this a step further. And um, we have taken this to um, daycares, We've taken it to um, Head Start programs um, and also to um, uh, preschools where we work with the, um, the families of the, of the children. And we encourage uh, families to work with their children on the um, uh, different activities relating to the story um, that the um, Money As You Grow book club is tied to. At the, at, um, so th this is our, um, our little uh, pre-introduction uh, when we go to the school and we talk with the families. <clears throat> the purpose in the, of the Money As You Grow book club is um, to um, engage families together with their children in activities that uh, encourages financial literacy directly and indirectly daily in all of, whether it's going to the grocery store or um, whether it's um, uh, cooking at home to um, uh, use the um, different skills that they've learned 
uh, from the lesson. We, we uh, at the end of the uh, uh, program, we um, ad address the families um, with the importance of a bank relationship, and then we um, give the family the um, savings voucher. <clears throat> Our actual savings program that we have is called Bank Day. And um, we work with local schools um, to uh, bring financial literacy and bring savings accounts to their school. We um, kick off Bank Day um, with an orientation where all of the, the we usually um, will pick one grade for that school for that school year. They come into the, um, uh, whether it's the gym or the um, auditorium. And um, we begin with a, a big kickoff with balloons and uh, with music. And um, we get them all excited about um, kicking off bank day. We use the Money Smart program and we go in monthly and we teach different, um, the different um, money. Um, smart uh, modules. In addition, um, we work with the students on finding ways that they can earn their own money, um, whether it's with birthday gifts or allowances. We give them ideas uh, for age appropriate um, jobs that they can do in their neighborhood. Um, and uh, um, we then, um, they, they, uh, bring in their um, money uh, monthly um, and it's deposited into their um, minor savings ac um, account. Um, the goals are set at the, um, at the uh, beginning of the um, program. Um, they um, learn about budgeting, um, how to keep a ledger, how to do a deposit slip. Um, at the end of the program, the um, children at the end of the school year, they write an essay on um, how Bank Day impacted their future. Um, we believe that it's um, our responsibility to ensure financial literacy standards are introduced at the elementary age. And that's why we usually take our Bank Day program to elementary schools. However, we have also uh, taken the um, program to junior high and high schools and introduced um, the student checking account with that. Um, we uh, feel that um, this would be, th that Bank Day has helped um, in a positive uh, direction to give responsibility in the way that um, earning and spending and budgeting um, at a very young age can begin. One of the rewards that we lately have experienced with um, some of our past, um, um, our past former uh, Bank Day students who have continued in the program, uh, the families that have continued from um, the book club program, were the calls that we have had both during COVID and our community recently um, was hit with a hurricane and how appreciative they were that they actually had um, a savings account that they could lean on uh, during um, this time. And that has probably been the um, one thing, uh, the number of calls, the number of letters that we have received that thank you for introducing us to savings um, and that are how much our savings account and our bank relationship, um, we have seen it in, come to fruition, the benefits of it. So that's our bank's um, saving program, uh, Bank Day. Um, it usually lasts uh, five to six months. Um, we don't go into the school in September. We let the school get situated, let the, um, the classes um, settle in. We usually go around November and we go through May. However, this year we have not been able to implement Bank Day because um, match our schools, uh, even though our schools um, are open, um, we, they are not allowing um, outside um, speakers and outside programs. But our, um, our former participants are still coming in with their little um, 
amount uh, and making their, um, their deposit. So it's a successful program. Um, we um, have had probably over 1,800 um, in the year, in the last, we started this program four years ago. Um, savings accounts opened by, by um, young adults. And um, so we feel it's a success and we're looking forward to go back into the schools once um, the doors are opened up for us. I have tools available that if um, anyone is interested in Bank Day, the letters to the school, the um, uh, topics that are discussed, um, the different lesson plans, um, the um, how the the initial convocation, the first day, what what all you can do for that, um, all the tools relating to uh, Bank Day, um, sample letters like I like I had said, uh, the certificates of completion. If anyone is interested in Bank Day, I'd be more than happy to um, supply all the tools. All you would have to do is personalize it to the school that you would be participating with. And that ends my presentation. Well, thank you very much, Kelly. And I want to uh, mention uh, to emphasize that every participant can add a uh, question in the chat's comment or uh, in the chat section, I should say, sorry, um, or in the questions section. And if you're on mobile or if you're on a laptop, you should be able to do it. Um, but if you put a question in the chat section, uh, we will collect them at the end. And at the end, you see that there's a Q&A session. So we'll get to as many as we can. So if you have any questions, make sure to throw them down there and I will be collecting those and we'll be going over that at the very end. Thanks so much, um, Callie and Ryan. Um, next, we will hear from Mike Foley. Mike, are you there? I'm here, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Um, <clears throat> but thank you so much for having me today. Um, so I'm from Reading Cooperative Bank. Um, and just a little information about the bank. We are a state chartered bank um, that was founded in 1886. We have eight branches among seven different communities. Um, we're a half a billion dollar bank on the North Shore. We're about 20 miles north of Boston. Um, and currently have 90 employees. Uh, we are really rooted in the communities that we serve. So we do a whole host of uh, financial literacy initiatives. Um, one of our main um, and one of our most successful are that we have two in-school branches at two of the local high schools. Um, we host multiple financial fairs throughout the year. Um, we have a relationship with another uh, school called Abbott Academy where uh, we have members of the bank go in for an eight to 16 week program. Um, and then we have a multiple of other financial events and presentations that we do um, among elementary, middle and high school. Um, it does help that part of the core curriculum for Massachusetts schools is that they need to have some sort of um, financial literacy. Um, and because of our relationship with some of the schools, we get called in to do all sorts of classes, whether it's um, like a high school math class when they talk about interest rates and we can go in and talk about the products and services that banks offer. Um, one of the local colleges will have us sit in their business 101 class uh, to talk about different accounts and different loan and topics that the kids wanna cover. Um, we've helped out with career days and we've um, do a lot of work with the ABA book program um, in our elementary schools, not so much this year because of COVID, but uh, it's a great program. We go in um, in any Title I school, um, all the kids get free books. You go in, you read the book, the book has to do with money, and there's a whole host of different books for different grade ranges um, that just get you in there to talk to the kids and then start a conversation about um, savings. So our in-school branches, um, our first one opened about 11 years ago. Um, Massachusetts had started a 
how do I want to put it, um, had allowed a lot of school districts, um, because a lot of the schools were older, to get tax credits for um, either building a new school or renovating a current existing school. Um, and one of the local high schools, um, like 20 years ago, started um, having an in-school branch, and it's kind of taken off. Um, right now, in the state, there's about 25 to 30 bank school programs among different um, community banks in Massachusetts. Um, it's great because we get huge support from the school, the staff, um, and the parents. Um, these are full service branches, so we will do everything from opening up accounts, doing teletransactions, to even taking uh, loans um, more for the staff than for the kids. Um, but it's great. So the concept is that the kids can take this as one of their business electives. And they come in, um, they learn the te teller skills. So they're learning a little bit of a trade. And then in addition, part of their curriculum is bank financial literacy and compliance. So we go over all the different parts of a checking account. Uh, we talk about goal setting. Uh, the different types of savings accounts that are out there, um, how to budget, and then long-term savings, which include CDs, um, IRAs, 401ks, um, stuff like that. Um, the in-school branches are open to students that are sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Uh, they take the class for one half of the school year, um, and they're in there for one of the periods a day that they have. Um, in it so we're able to kind of do a lot with them in that time frame um, in addition for the bank it works out good because when as you start to train these tellers if we have some part-time positions open they're able to come and work for the bank um, and we've even worked with the uh, commonwealth of massachusetts division of labor to start an apprenticeship program um, so kids in the in-school branches get free apprenticeship hours, and then if they're hired by the bank, they can continue and get an apprenticeship um, through us on, for, on the retail banking side for all different positions. Um, on the curriculum, it's great because it's a hands-on class for the kids. Um, we find that a lot of kids, especially the ones that have issues learning lecture-based, really enjoy it really thrive and really kind of connect and say, okay, I'm going to, when it's time to work, I'm, I know I'm going to be able to succeed because it's hands-on and I'm taking the different things that I've learned in, through all my grades of school and college and then implementing it um, in the real world. Um, we have huge success and support, as I said, from the school, um, and so when a lot of the teachers will say, hey, do you have, you know, hey, I heard you got a job, have you opened up a bank account, why don't you head down to the bank? Um, there is a lot of ownership for the school district that this is their bank, even though this, you know, the school name isn't part of the bank, um, which is great. Um, we find that the kids enjoy coming down because it's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning um, as the kids are struggling to fill out a deposit ticket or withdrawal. Sometimes they are intimidated to ask a bank employee. So what they're able to do is go in and ask one of the student tellers, which is usually a friend or somebody they know that they feel comfortable sitting and kind of talking to and learning how to properly fill out a check, properly make a deposit uh, through it. In addition to the in-school branches, um, we work with Abbott Academy, which is in Lawrence, Mass. Um, this is an eight to 12 week program, um, which is really fun about this is the students select the topic. So the topics span um, anywhere from mortgages, credit cards, um, and saving money. Um, and each week, somebody different from the bank gets to go in and meet with these kids and they get to make um, a really good connection. Um, 
both between Abbott and the two high school branches, we're able to offer our um, student account offerings. Um, so the first is a student checking account. Um, we also do student savings, um, either a statement or passbook. Uh, we really encourage the younger kids, um, because it's something visual, to get a passbook savings and then open up and they're able to see their deposits, they're able to see the balance grow, they're able to see the interest being posted, um, and you can, and our staff can use that to kind of educate the younger kids. Um, our main goal um, is to do no harm with these accounts. Um, so we really work hard um, to educate the kids when they have student checking and savings accounts, um, whether it's talking to them if they do overdraw, um, you know, we're really lucky in all the years we've done this, we've had zero losses um, on our student accounts, and we have a really low close rate because the kids have so much ownership in these accounts because they've opened it at the high school branch that they went to, um, and I have kids that, you know, graduated 10 years ago that are still sitting in a student checking account, um, and they do not want to close it out because that was their first checking account um, and it, it means something to them. Um, there's a lot, we do do an incentive for the kids to open up the account. If they open it with $50 or more, um, we give them a $25 gift card um, and every year it changes because um, we try to keep it to a place where the students themselves like going to, um, which Kind of makes it even more bigger incentive in the two high school branches where you know the school districts limit us to what we can do marketing wise um, but what we are able to do is kind of put up a poster with the offering and sometimes just seeing that they can earn a gift card somewhere is enough of a tease to get them into the branch so that we can actually start that relationship teach them how to bank get them comfortable coming in and then you know as they get um, jobs and they start working and they're getting the direct deposit, then we start talking about, well, you can, you know, put some in your checking account, you can put some in your savings, we can set up automatic deposits. Um, we use the kids sometimes um, to help us out when we're offering different services of the bank to kind of get their take on it. Um, you know, when we first developed uh, mobile banking and mobile deposit capture, which is the kids think is the best thing in the world because um, they don't have to do anything. They can just take a picture with their phones that they're on all the time anyways. So it's really easy and convenient um, and it's worked out really well for us. So that ends my part of the presentation. Um, I look forward to any questions that you guys have at the end. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike. And um, next we have Elena. Elena, are you there? I am, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, Ron, I think you actually have my presentation, is that correct? I do, let me just pull it up. Okay. So um, first of all, I wanna thank the New Jersey Coalition for Financial Education and the FDIC. Um, for putting this on. This is one of our favorite things that we do here at our bank is our financial literacy outreach program. Um, and those community affairs specialists out there, um, special shout out to Mr. John Olson, who is ours. I know that um, I have called and emailed him no less than 500,000 times about ideas and things that we wanna do and how can we make it work. So I'm especially thankful for those community affairs specialists and how we have access to them and we can call them with questions. So, Ryan, if you'll go on to the next slide, we're going to move through pretty quickly because I know we're kind of up against a time crunch. Um, a little bit about our bank. We're a small bank in northwest Alabama. We only have 10 locations. And in addition to those 10 locations, we have six student-operated branches. And the student-operated branches are part of our financial literacy outreach program, um, but they're not the whole program. So, Ryan, if you'll hit that next slide for me. Our entire financial literacy outreach theory is that we will start talking to students when they're young and we will talk to them multiple times throughout their school 
um, career. So we start when they're in fourth grade with Teach Children to Save Day. Then in um, eighth grade, we go and see them again with Choices, which is a different um, nonprofit organization. But they talk about the effects of good choices and bad choices, even in the financial realm. We see them again in high school with the Get Smart About Credit Day. We have the six student operated branches. We do a ton of reality fairs and reality checks. And if you don't know what that is, email me. I will tell you all about it. And then like Mike and Callie were saying, you know, once you have that relationship with the school, they'll call you and they'll say, hey, you know, we need a speaker for, you know, how an interest rate works or how to borrow money to get a car or what is a down payment. And we go in for all those things. We have sort of the reputation in the community of if you need number two pencils for testing, call First Metro Bank. They will always be there to help the students. Next slide, Ryan. We really pr pride ourselves on our program. It's a huge part of what it is that we do. I know that I have called Reading Cooperative Bank, where Mike is, several times because theirs is their um, outlook on this is so similar to ours. And so I've called them multiple times and said, hey, what are you doing about this? You know, what's your idea on this? How are you doing this compliance wise? So I say all that to say, if you ever have a question about you know, a student operated branch or a financial literacy outreach program, please, please reach out to some of these folks who have been doing this for a while because I have never once called another bank and gotten a no. Every single time I've called, they've always said, here's the information, here's how we do CIP, here's, you know, our BSA program, here's how we train our tellers. And so it's a super collaborative um, part of the financial industry, which is just super refreshing. Okay, next slide, Ryan. So our student operated branches, which is what I'm going to talk to you the most about today, they were established in 2008, I remember, because it was my birthday. So August 19th, 2008, we opened our first two student operated branches. Hit that next slide for me, Ryan. We are now up to six student operated branches. And so the most um, often, the question that I receive the most often is, how do you do it? What is your process? So I just kind of gave you guys like my process about how, how I go about opening student operated branch. The first step is always a written proposal. This outlines your rights and responsibilities and the school's rights and responsibilities. And it also puts a time limit in there because what you don't want is to put in all the time and effort to put in a student operated branch for a new administration to come in the next year and decide that they don't want that anymore. So I have um, generic copies of this. You can email me and um, I will be glad to email it to you. The next thing is, and this is where I call Mr. or called Mr. Olson so many times, but permission from state and federal regulators. What does that look like? I will tell you if you're with the FDIC, the last time I checked, you do not have to apply for another branch charter. And that's a huge deal uh, for a lot of people is just knowing you don't have to apply for another branch charter. Security is a huge, huge, huge part of our program. We make sure that our kids are trained. We make sure that, you know, everything is safe, that we're hooked in with, um, we, you know, supply cameras to the school so that the school can watch. So security is a big, big, um, big part of it. Once you kind of have those first three, everything else will sort of fall in line. Your compliance, your operations, your oversight, building the branch. Um, a lot of times I'll find that people want to start with that because it's the most fun. But when you build a branch, please do keep in mind that you do have to meet ADA compliance with that. So just like you would in a regular branch. So you do need to make sure that you're in school branches do meet um, all ADA compliance guidelines. That is a common error that I have run across. And then the last thing that we do is choose our student teller. So Ryan, if you'll hit that next screen for me, I'll tell you a little bit about that really quickly. The first thing that they do is they complete an application. Then all of those applications are given to the school for review and approval. Schools can't tell us, hey, this kid has a major disciplinary issue or this child, you know, never comes to school or whatever the case may be. So we let the school go through and take out students who don't qualify, whether it's because of GPA or attendance or major disciplinary issues. Um, but they have our guidelines and they remove all applicants who do not meet those qualifications. Once they have removed all of those, we schedule an interview for every single child who wants to be a student teller. And they actually come to the bank and do an interview with me and with their teacher. So the two of us are in there. We want them to have the experience of what it is to be an interview, because I don't know about y'all, but my very first interview when I was 15 years old, it was terrible. So it's one of those learned skills. So we want to give those kids the opportunity uh, to have an interview and to learn those interview skills. Once that's done, then we notify the kids with the telephone call and in writing. And when we um, notify them in writing, we also lay out our training dates. And this obviously was in a pre-COVID world, but every single student teller for all of our student branches were required to come to our bank for two days in the summer and um, receive their training. And it was 
the most fun. Obviously, we didn't get to do it this year, but it was the most fun because they got to meet other people who are interested in the same things as them, um, but were from different high schools. All right, next slide. The biggest part of our program is probably, you know, sort of the same thing that Mike and Callie were talking about is that account. What we found out very early on, and I don't know if you guys know this or not, but in the state of Alabama, the age of majority is 19. So this puts a lot of kids in a weird place between high school and college because most kids graduate high school at 17 or 18 years old, but they're not considered, or they're still considered a minor until they turn 19. So obviously in the state of Alabama, you know, in order to have an account in your name only without a joint owner, typically you'd have to be 19. Well, what we found out pretty quickly is that we have a lot of students, and I'm sure you guys do too, that do not have an adult in their life that they can trust with their money. Because of course, if you're a joint owner, you have equal rights and responsibilities to the money in the account. So what would happen is the child would get their little paycheck from working fast food or whatever, and it would be directly deposited into that joint account in the adult, and I use that term very loosely, would go to the bank and withdraw all the money. So what we decided, I went to our board of directors and I said, look, we've got to have an account that these kids can have on their own, even though they're minors. I realize the liability that that puts on the bank, but I want it. And so our directors stepped out in faith and let us have this account. So this account can be opened by any 15-year-old and it only has their name on it. They are the sole owner of all funds in that account. Nobody else can touch that money or um, even inquires to whether or not they have an account. So that's any 15 year old within our trade area that comes in and wants to open an account, but they can also be opened at the student operated branches. So ages 15 plus, we can CIP them with just with their school ID. The minimum balance um, is a dollar. The minimum opening balance is a dollar. There's no charge for any of the ancillary services, and we have not lost not one penny on these accounts, which is kind of like what Mike was saying. When you give someone something that they need, they will take care of it, especially these kids. All right, next slide, Ryan. Operationally, um, we have our kids offline, but I know some people do have their kids online. I have a student teller manual that I will be glad to share with you that outlines every single transaction they can complete. Unlike Mike's branches, ours are limited service, meaning they can do anything but loan applications, receipt of loan applications. Now, they can accept loan payments from um, staff and faculty there in the school, but they cannot accept loan applications because that just got into a whole fair lending world that our compliance team did not want to tangle with, and I completely understand that. All right, next slide, Ryan. That's it for me. I wanted to get us back on track. I feel like we're pretty much there, but um, uh, if you have any questions for me, please feel free to email me. I am not going to be able to stick around for the Q&A this afternoon, um, but please email me or call me, and I will be glad to answer any questions that you have. And we'll be making sure to uh, share, uh, share the contact information for our speakers uh, with you all so that you'll be able to reach out if we don't have time to get some questions. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much to um, each of our panelists, um, Callie, Mike, and Elena, for providing such a comprehensive overview of your program. Um, I know we didn't have a lot of time, but again, um, please submit your questions. Uh, if we don't get them get to them today, we will get them answered later. And I just want to remind everyone that you will hear later in the program about the FDIC's Youth Banking Network, where um, you, as a, a bank, can join other banks that are interested or are already offering these types of programs to talk with one another and to learn from one another and um, just to have some additional support um, in doing that. So you'll hear about that a little later. Um, and one other thing um, before we move on to the next panel, if anyone on the, on the line knows of a bank school partnership focused on youth savings in the state of New Jersey, if you could just drop that in the chat for us, uh, we'd appreciate it. And now I will turn it back over to Michael Drulis. Hello, Darnell. Um, first of all, hey, Michael. Fan fantastic presentation. I tell you, we're, we're moving quick, but we're covering so much ground. So. Um, you know, I'm sure anyone who's who's on is really just paying attention. They don't want to miss a detail. And I got to tell you, Alana's accent, uh, whatever she says, it, it's great. 
I, I love a Southern accent. So thanks for bringing people from all over the country together for us. Um, so I'm gonna let Ryan and his smooth radio voice continue to introduce our next set of speakers in our panel. Thank you, thank you. Uh, my smooth radio voice indeed. Um, let me just pull that up real quick and we're gonna go through the next uh, speakers here, hold on. And Ryan, let's pick up on Darnell's um, previous introduction. Maybe we'll just do some names, some companies, um, and, and let folks you know, catch up on bios later so we can get right to the meat of the topic. Absolutely, I definitely agree with that. All righty. So we have our next speakers up. Uh, for this next panel, Gary uh, Chismadia is a consultant for Cross State Credit Union Association. Uh, he has presented over 500 programs to students ranging from elementary level to college and senior citizens and was recognized by NJCFE in 2015. Uh, since retiring from state service, he's devoted his time to expand financial uh, reality fairs to schools throughout New Jersey and Pennsylvania. We also will have Steve Beard. Ryan, before you go on, I was um, just want to share, Gary has been a, a true member and participant in the coalition. Many events we've had, Gary's been there in the front row at our annual symposiums. Um, and it was, a, it was an honor to be involved that year when Gary got the award. And not only are we so proud of the work he did uh, upon his retirement from the state, we gave him the award. Years later, he, he's still toiling in the vineyard, so to speak. So thanks for being, being with us, Gary. Absolutely. And, uh, oops, sorry, wrong direction there. Christy Beardron, Director of Education at Junior Achievement of NJ, uh, which is a statewide organization powering over 80,000 students annually with their financial knowledge and skills they need to uh, own their economic success. And Christy oversees JNJ's partnership with the Department of Education as their official partner for financial literacy and education and professional development. So without further ado, let's throw it over to our first. I believe that would be Christy. That would be me, yes. Um, is it possible to share my screen? Absolutely. All right. All right, everybody see that? Yeah, we see it. We got it. Excellent. All right. And I will make up for lost time, too, I promise. So welcome, everybody. And a huge thanks to Darnell and Ryan and Michael, the New Jersey Coalition, and your event sponsors for having me today. I appreciate it. So um, I'm with Junior Achievement. We are a, a global organization and a national organization here in New Jersey. We reach, uh, well, we were set to reach about 85,000 students last year, but do a little pivot. Uh, when schools closed, but during um, in the last six months, we have really taken all of our um, great in-person programs that we had, and we have moved them to an online format because we um, we feel it's very important to meet uh, teachers and students where they are. So we focus on uh, three pillars, one of them being financial literacy. And our, our key financial literacy program, our capstone program is called JA Finance Park. And that is what I'm going to uh, briefly talk about today, uh, the curriculum and the simulation. So Finance Park is our capstone program for personal financial planning. Um, and what we've done here in New Jersey is we have aligned our curriculum to New Jersey's academic standards for financial literacy. So here in New Jersey, um, we have not only have a graduation requirement for all students to receive a semester of financial literacy education before they graduate, but we also have very clear academic standards. Um, uh, that uh, took effect in 2014 uh, for financial literacy. And those standards have recently been redeveloped. Um, and I had the, the pleasure of uh, participating on that standards review committee. And uh, one thing that I thought was interesting when we review, when we updated the standards for financial literacy education in New Jersey, we thought that it was very important to focus on financial psychology. Um, Educators are used to um, providing differentiated instruction for their students um, you know, in, in, in core subjects. But we also thought it's important, and Darnell alluded to this a little earlier, um, that uh, financial psychology um, is a really important thing. You can't teach financial literacy the same way to all students because we do have those behaviors that are very often rooted in our childhood experiences. 
um, a student that um, that grows up uh, in a family where um, you know money was tight is going to have a different kind of relationship and may have different kind of spending habits than a student who grew up in a family where they didn't have to think about money. So um, as we as we look to the new standards, which are set to take effect um, in the fall of 2021. Um, certainly, financial psychology is a big piece of that, uh, as well as um, civic responsibility for financial literacy. So um, we are, as, as, um, as uh, the New Jersey Department of Education's um, official financial literacy partner, we are committed to ensuring that our curriculum is not only provided to all teachers and students in New Jersey at no cost, but that it does align to those standards, the ones that are in effect now and the ones that will take effect in the fall. So a little bit about our um, Finance Park program. And again, I'm gonna stress that this is a free program um, available to all New Jersey students. If there's anyone on the line, uh, educators from a different state, um, most J areas do have financial uh, Finance Park available. Um, so please check in with your local J area if you are not from New Jersey. Um, but the curriculum um, has, has themes and um, there are two levels of Finance Park. Entry level is really geared for middle school students. So um, again, as alluded earlier, we now have a middle school financial literacy requirement. We've always had the standards, but now um, financial literacy uh, by legislation must be taught in all grades, sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade. So our entry level curriculum is geared for middle school and our advanced curriculum is geared for high school. So you'll see advanced is a little bit more um, technical, a lot more focus on employment and education. So, so telling students about how their, the choices that they make for, um, for education and career path um, do, have, um, do have financial implications. Um, costing, out the, the co costing out your education, making sure that the job you're gonna get um, is going to be appropriate to the amount that you're paying for college. And each of those um, curriculum, the entry and the advanced, um, both are available on a full, fully online format. So previously, um, students uh, had workbooks and teachers had workbooks, and we provided training, um, in-person training to educators. And then students came to our education center in Edison for that final debrief simulation. Um, now, JUSA has spent um, the summer working you know, overtime to put all this in an online blended learning format. So this can be fully online for um, all those schools that are now going back to completely virtual. And again, I'm gonna say it probably the third time now, the, the curriculum is available at no cost. Um, so this is what our simulated city uh, looks like, and hopefully we'll be back there soon. We have an education center in Edison where we have, uh, we could have up to 200 students a day coming in. Um, last year, I think we had about over 10,000 students coming to our education center just for Finance Park. We also have another simu simulated city there called J. Biztown that's for uh, grades five and six, also aligned to financial literacy. Um, so the students come to our simulated city and they are given a tablet and a fictional persona. Um, for example, you are 32 years old, you're employed in XYZ industry, you're making XYZ amount of money per month, and then you have to figure out um, what's your net monthly income and then allocate your income to 18 different places where you have to spend your money. So uh, like education, uh, car insurance, uh, sewer, water utilities, um, clothing, childcare, uh, internet. A lot of kids don't realize that you have to pay for internet. Um, so the kids have to make choices and then sometimes they have to go back and change their minds. So for example, if they decide that they wanna get a, uh, a convertible car, right because it's really cool and then they go over to the car insurance kiosk and say wow the insurance is a lot more for this nice convertible maybe i better backtrack and get a get a, a, a different car so they really get those um those hands-on learning experiences and they learn how to make um those choices and this is at the again the end of the program so when they've completed uh J, the j finance park curriculum they take everything that they've learned and put it into practice here at our education center and you'll see that bottom photo there um, students working on their tablets and this is where we bring in um, corporate and community volunteers as well. So we have great partnerships with a lot of our banks here in New Jersey, where they'll send um, a team of volunteers in on any given day to our simulated city, J.A. Finance Park, and they'll coach students through the activities. And that, that's a great part because 
our volunteers really um, give that real world example to the students. So they're, um, they're, they're learning from their volunteers, um, you know, how to make those wise, wise choices and, um, and all these, those other great things that our volunteers can, can share with them. Again, the simulation, um, I kind of went over this already. I won't uh, belabor that, but um, it really is a, a hands-on interactive experience that they enjoy. So uh, since we are not able to get together in person, we do have a virtual simulation. Um, same thing, the students put their learning into practice. Uh, they can work through the simulation at their own pace. It's all done online. And the virtual simulation takes place over three class periods. And we do have um, volunteers that will come in to do that as well. So if there are um, folks on the line that are interested in volunteering for junior achievement, um, we, we, are, we always need virtual volunteers, um, even more now than ever. Um, our teachers are really asking for volunteers to come in and join their class virtually and coach them through the simulated experience. So the, the simulated experience, again, like the curriculum, was just redeveloped. So it is brand new and fresh. And uh, it kind of looks like this. The students, they'll, you see, they get their, their avatar, and they have to go through this little city and make their wise choices. So I went through that very quickly. Um, but again, if you have any questions, if you'd like to um, get more information about J Finance Park and bring it to your school, um, it's, it's um, again, it's free. Uh, and it meets uh, our state st edu uh, academic standards. And uh, we do provide professional development to teachers as well. So we don't just uh, give teachers a curriculum and say, have fun. We are there to, to guide you. In fact, that is my primary role, is to, um, is to provide training and professional development to educators, because we know that our educators um, are, are really tasked with a big challenge um, with online learning. So we are there to provide support. So again, um, uh, open any questions later and thank you so much again for having me today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, well, moving right along, our next speaker, Gary Chismadia, is going to be speaking uh, as a financial reality fair consultant. So you could uh, pull up his presentation. Gary, are you there? Uh, it appears that we've uh, lost Gary for the moment, unfortunately, um, but I'm sure he'll be back a bit later. So in that case, I think we should just move right along on the agenda to Ron, uh, Ron Chirigo, if I'm saying that name correctly. Uh, apologies to Ron if I am uh, saying your name incorrectly. No, that's... that's uh... There's no correct pronunciation, Ryan. No worries. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity. Um, and I guess I guess Gary could could go after me. Um, so um, uh, eventually, Ryan will post the the, the webinar, but uh, the the PowerPoint. Uh, but before I start, I just want to say that uh, for those banks that are interested in joining the Youth Banking Network. Uh, it's fairly easy to do. The, uh, send an email to youthsavings at fdic.gov. Uh, some of the reasons why you might want to join the Youth Banking Network is uh, you get to hear people like Callie, uh, Elena, uh, Mike uh, during our webinars. We have periodic webinars and we really try to maximize the intelligence that our banks have and uh, share that information, share that knowledge uh, in a synergistic way amongst the banks. And that's what the Youth Banking Network is really all about. So before I forget, I'm gonna uh, put a, uh, so that I don't, I don't, uh, I don't exploit the, uh, or exhaust all our time here today. Uh, I wanna thank Darnell Sutton, a uh, great teammate of mine and uh, everyone else at the FDIC for the opportunity as well. So uh, uh, next slide, we'll uh, deal with uh, the youth savings pilot. That uh, in essence helped us generate um, a lot of intelligence for youth banking, which is uh, simply defined as combining 
financial literacy with experiential learning, hands-on learning. And uh, that is uh, a, an effort that we did a couple years ago uh, that involved 21 banks, all sorts of banks uh, all over the country, all different sizes with all different kinds of experiences and takes when it comes to youth banking. Um, I see a blank uh, slide, but that's okay. I'm gonna continue on. Uh, on the, on the uh, next slide, you'll see the uh, list of banks and get an idea of uh, what we did with those uh, banks. Um, again, the core piece of our youth savings effort is uh, distributing uh, potential best practices, promising practices amongst the banks that are interested in carrying out youth uh, banking activities. On the next slide, you'll see uh, a glimpse of some of the things that we produced. Uh, we produced um, a lessons learned, and that's a sort of a quick overview of uh, uh, what the banks did in terms of uh, youth banking and uh, a sort of a cheat sheet, a roadmap on uh, some uh, basic core steps, five principal steps a bank uh, could take in order to develop its own uh, uh, youth savings effort. That all led to the formation of what we have now. Uh, we have a youth banking network consisting of about 70 banks nation, uh, nationwide. And uh, the gist of that is we know that banks sometimes learn from the FDIC about these sort of initiatives. Um, we obviously learn from banks, but the core piece of it is banks more often than not learn from each other. And I think Elena shared that, what she didn't tell you <laughs> is uh, she more often gets calls from not only the banks in our network, but banks outside our network. Um, we also, uh, uh, as a result of our involvement in youth savings, uh, use the information, the intelligence we glean, and uh, incorporated that into our Money Smart curricula. So you'll see there that we have uh, ideas for banks on how to uh, help students uh, establish bank accounts. Next slide, uh, you'll see how we. Uh, went about conducting the pilot and it involved a lot of interviews, a lot of uh, group calls uh, with schools and bank surveys, et cetera. Next slide. Um, now, this is, this is the, uh, a, a very important piece of it. Uh, we, we ran across a lot of banks who maybe had the, the branches in school like uh, First Metro or Capital One. Uh, we had other banks uh, like Community Bank who had uh, in-school banking activities, uh, banking for the day, uh, once a week, once a month, bringing the bank to, to the school. And, and other banks uh, brought the kids directly to a, a local branch. Some banks uh, did all three, depending on the schools that they were working with. Uh, some banks uh, uh, had interactions with K through six and middle school and high school. Some, some had a, a select targeted uh, arena. Uh, some banks were able to synergistically use the older students uh, to help the younger students. There's all sorts of ways and you can uh, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. All you need to do is go to the FDIC Youth Banking Resource Center. Uh, that's uh, on our website. There's a whole host of publicly available resources that we make available uh, to, to anyone. You don't have to be a bank to explore that website. But the advantage of being a member of the Youth Banking Network is that we also have a variety of products that are specifically catered to the banks that are involved in the network. And that's because we don't want the products to be misused or misinterpreted, misapplied, and we want to ensure that the, uh, the banks have everything they need in order to maximize uh, those kinds of resources. One resource, for instance, 
uh, is a reality fair guide that we uh, provide to the members of the youth banking uh, network. Now we've learned from a variety of sources, some of which are talk, uh, talking today uh, in order to form that guide. And if you remember of the Youth Banking Network, uh, in March of the upcoming year, we will be presenting you with our toolkit, which is a variety of materials and resources that can be used at a reality fair. Because we know that uh, not all students have access to uh, a finance park uh, or, or another organization of that sort. So we want banks themselves to be able to carry out uh, a reality fair and uh, even, even a small scale um, to, to carry out the, uh, that experience and to benefit uh, kids uh, no matter where they are uh, geographically. Next slide. You'll see there uh, that we really broke down uh, in our pilot, uh, about a third of the banks uh, uh, had uh, one of those uh, three models, either a branch at the bank or, or at the school or an uh, in-school uh, um, ad hoc arrangement or taking the kids to the bank. Next slide. Um, now, there's a variety of ways for banks to uh, find a way to work with the school. Um, uh, the husband may be a teacher uh, and whose wife is president of the bank or vice versa. And that's how the, 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 the initial uh, uh, foothold uh, relationship takes place. But there's a variety of means uh, uh, to do that. Um, and uh, it's, uh, that's the kind of stuff uh, that's the kind of issue that's uh, talked about and discussed uh, during these meetings within the Youth Banking Network. The next slide. Um, the account characteristics, Elena and others spoke about uh, the different kinds of accounts. We found in our pilot that uh, banks had discovered that there, it broke down into three pieces. Um, in some settings, uh, the parents are dead set that um, they, they wanted custodial accounts. In other settings, the parents were hands off. Uh, in still other settings, we had third parties serving the role of a custodian. Uh, in one uh, school uh, instance, for instance, the parents uh, were from a large, largely immigrant population. And, and that particular demographic uh, didn't have a high degree of trust with any kind of uh, financial letters institution, let alone a bank. And so the school itself served as a custodian for other uh, kids because that school had a relationship with that particular bank. And But the, the kids themselves, even though their parents may have not been banked, uh, in essence, were able to, to learn that experience uh, through the school. And they often, uh, then, well, that goes my alarm, so I know I'm at time. But those kids uh, eventually uh, were able to get get their parents uh, uh, to gravitate towards get, uh, becoming banked. So there's a variety of things uh, to learn from it. Um, uh, the rest of the slides, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I believe, will be uh, provided to you. Um, um, Ryan, if you could go to the uh, oh, one other thing. Uh, this is cool. We have a relationship with the Conference of State Banking Supervisors, so you can go uh, to that particular website that they help uh, they developed at our request to figure out what the uh, particular citations, the law, rules, and guidance are regarding establishing uh, accounts for minors, non-custodial accounts for uh, for for kids, etc. Um, and then. The uh, last slide, uh, you'll see uh, my contact information. And I just want to thank you all for your time today. And Ryan, I apologize if I went over time. No, that's perfectly fine, Ron. Thank you for sharing that information with us. Um, I want to say that I'm happy to say we've got Gary back on the call. Uh, Gary, are you are you there? Yeah, I'm here. There Can you we hear go. me? That's good. All right. Let me just uh, quickly pull up your 
uh, presentation. Hold on. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry about that, everybody. All of a sudden, my laptop froze, so I had to switch over to my iPad. So we'll see where we go from here. Um, but thanks, Ron, for picking up on that and taking off for me. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, reality fairs. Um, when we look at them, we're brought to with New Jersey. We've been doing it in New Jersey for the past ten years now, um, as my bio says. And uh, when we started out. It was, we were New Jersey Credit Union League. As of January 1st of this year, we switched, we merged with um, Pennsylvania's association, and now we are now the cross state association, credit union association. So, but now we're dealing with both Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Uh, the fairs themselves are outstanding. We have, we've got nothing but positive feedback from everyone, all the students. Uh, when we've done it, when we had it, we had people request us, the seniors, citizens, said, hey, okay, can you help us out? Because their grandkids went and told them about it. And so when they came up to us and we said, oh, sure, we did it. So we modified the program so that the senior citizens can now get it because a lot of situations, they said, we're having situations where our, um, our uh, spouse passed away and we're not really know what to do with our financial activity and stuff and so we helped them out on that and modified it to that um, then we had the uh, department of children and families their special needs students they asked us if we put together a program for that and we modified it for that so we have with the pregnant teens so deep they want to know how can the teens once they have a baby what can we do and so we modified it to that situation and then um, juvenile commission juvenile justice commission came in and asked us if we can modify it to do that. So we've really modified this program a number of times to fit the particular situations that people are asking for. Some of the comments were from juvenile justice, some of the guys that were in there afterwards came up and said to us, can we, I wish we had this before we came in, we wouldn't be here. And so, you know, it does make you feel good that you're actually making progress with them. Uh, the fair itself, it's a unique opportunity where we had put it in for it was up until March of this year. It was an in-person program and we've had it in the gyms. We've had it in the cafeterias. We had it wherever they had enough room to put in the programs because there's a 14, there's 14 stations that the people, the students act go out to and those stations, they find out where they have a budget that they have to follow. And what it takes into consideration is their monthly salary, and then how can they fit their food, their furniture, their housing, their transportation, their entertainment, and everything within that those guidelines of the money that they have from the job they had. Uh, what we find out is that they are surprised. They get a salary, say, of thirty-six thousand dollars, and they think, oh, it's going to be plenty of money. And then what they find out is there's no money left from the $36,000 that they think they have for the year. And then they go back and have to look at what we're doing. So we go back, we talk to them about that. Uh, the financial counselors at the end of the program look at it and say, where could you cut your money back? Where can you um, change so you make it? Uh, Ryan, can you change it over to my next slide, please? Okay, here's the budget that they basically use. The front page of the budget it shows what are the FICO scores? It shows what their salary is, what is taking out of it. Um, and so we go right through it and they look at it and they get to know, hey, well, where are we gonna go from this? It's color coded so that with the green, it's the credit union activities. With the purple, it's credit union credit cards. Um, loans are in the pink section. And then we have transportation in the orange and we go right on through and then we come up to the blue where we're actually talking about monthly expenses. So if we go to the next slide, Ryan. Okay, here's what we're looking at. We're looking at the sheets and they'll get the sheet, they'll have the money 
to look at it and then to go to each one and see how much they're going to do. We have a workbook that also goes along with this that we had to put in place because of the way the, fire, the virus has hit. We've gone online. And so everything that we used to do in person is now online. And so they go through it, they have the workbook with them, and they can look and see what the actual options are for the rent, the mortgage, that sort of situation, the housing, what utilities they need to use, the auto and the insurance, their um, food, what food options are there, their um, clothing, how they're gonna, what clothing options we're gonna deal with, entertainment, the TV, the internet, and the um, cell phones. And so when we get to that point, they go through all that and hopefully when they're finished with all that, they have some money left. Uh, a lot of times they don't and they say, why don't I? And we go back and you look at that they bought a Lexus, they got the newest and greatest iPhone, um, they bought a big house. And so from that situation, they learn and they find out that uh, people are, that what the parents and adults go through on a day-to-day -day basis. And so from that point, we are in good shape from that. And the students, so from that point, the students have really got picked up on it. Uh, they have nothing but praise for the most part, and they're really glad they go through it. Uh, and so that's how we've modified it and put it together. And I know we have we took up a lot of time, with, so I really don't want to push it too much further. But if anybody has any questions or comments, contact me and I'll be more than happy to help you. And if you would like us to come into the schools, into a school and help, we can, that's no problem. There's no cost. One thing is there is no cost to the school for anything. Sponsoring credit unions pick up the cost and the foundations. And so there's no cost for the students or for the school districts at all. Okay, so any questions, I'd be more than happy to deal with it. And again, appreciate your patience. Have a good one. Well, I want to thank every uh, person who's spoken thus far. Um, we've gone through our list of speakers, and now uh, what remains is our Q&A session. Um, I want to thank also all the participants who have uh, inputted questions in our questions box here. And so now is the, I feel now is the time to go through a few of them while we still have some time left and answer them. So I'm going to start with... A question for Callie, uh, which is how do you measure that program for CRA credit? It's from Michelle. Okay. Um, you need to provide some factual uh, information. You're, you get one entry for um, uh, all of your presenters to that one school. You um, need to give the number of students you addressed, um, the topics that were covered, uh, the farm percentage for that school, the free and reduced uh, meal percentage for the school, um, the uh, um, follow-up, any follow-up that you may have had, um, any measuring information that you can provide, um, and uh, let's see, sorry, the number of num the presenters, um, and I guess that's that's those are the points that you need to uh, in, um, add to your report. Okay, thank you for that. To your, to your service, and you'll get service um, service uh, credit, CRA credit, um, if the school is greater than fifty percent free and reduced meals. All right, our next question is from Diane. How might housing communities get money as you grow or on bank day in these community education, educational programming? So I'm, I'm not sure who that was aimed for, but in terms of bank day, I think that might've been Callie again. Can, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Absolutely. So it's how might housing communities, uh, you know, get money as you grow on on bank day in these community educational programs? How might you get? Well, I'm I'm not sure. This is just how the question was written. I do apologize if it's uh, a bit uh, confusing. Um, 
I'm sorry, but it is how how we fund our programs. Is that how we fund our financial literacy program? Is is that the question? Um, well, I guess what I'll do is I'll just ask Diane if she wants to clarify by adding a, a second question in the question section. That might be more helpful. Okay, I'm terribly sorry. No, it's understandable. Um, so let's see if we can. Uh, move on to another question. I see this one is probably for um, Alana, who is left. So, ah, yes, this might be general for uh, the majority of the speakers, but we had a question saying that a lot of the programming that was talked about today uh, seems to be aimed toward high school kids. Is there any educational practices? that you think would also work for middle schoolers? So I really think this is a good question for any speaker who wants to talk about how their programming or programming they know would help middle school students versus, say, high school students. Well, our um, bank day is geared for elementary. Um, this is Callie. Um, mostly fifth and sixth grade or fifth grade. Uh, and then we do a follow up when they become sixth graders at middle school, but it's primarily um, for fifth graders. Anyone and the else? book club is primarily for pre K through second grade. Anyone else? Yeah, Ryan, this is Ron. I, I would just say that um, although in Callie's case, um, they decided to uh, implement that kind of strategy in elementary school. It can, uh, there's been banks that, that have done the same thing in in the middle school environment. It's usually, uh, you know, bringing the bank to the to the school for a day, um, and the advantage is you can give a, a little more responsibilities to the students. So some of the students uh, take on, although it's done in elementary school too a uh, little more uh, responsibilities in terms of serving as tellers or various playing various uh, bank functions. Um, so uh, the the curriculum might change a little bit. Um, they may uh, use, if they're using Money Smart, they'll, they'll use the, the middle school uh, curriculum, but um, which as you know, Money Smart for Young People is it divided up into those uh, different ages and, and, and great categories. Okay, um, I see another question here. This one I want to definitely address for the entire audience, uh, which is someone was asking for uh, information or materials. Um, we will be sending out uh, the contact info of all of our speakers uh, to the general audience so that they can reach out with questions and ask for specific materials, anything that they were interested in hearing with this. Uh, we definitely want to share that. So I just wanted to make that quick note. And I think we have time for just one more question. I actually see that a uh, um, good question. Actually, Ron asked a question for, I believe, Callie, was it, Ron? Is that what you were saying? Uh, yeah. How she is engaging kids with when COVID presents an in-person interaction. Yes, that has been a challenge. Um, we are uh, in the process of developing a couple of things. Um, uh, we have reached out to schools to see if they would if they would like some um, virtual lessons. We have sent them the Money Smart um, modules that are available and the um, lessons that we could um, teach. Um, we have developed our in the product we're working with our marketing department to develop a resource guide of every aspect of financial literacy program that is out there um, we've done a lot of research on that regard and um, we're going to put that resource guide on our um, internet and um, where um, teachers schools, nonprofits um, can um, use it and, and um, uh, where, uh, where 
resource materials and where what um, agencies provide the resource materials and what that re what that particular program um, might um, teach. Um, we are uh, in the pro we're working with our ad agency to do some videos again using um, some of the modules from um, Money Smart. And um, we're even thinking of maybe a um, an app for the kids to put on their phone um, where they would be able to play financial literacy games. Um, these are all some ideas that I have now set out to our ad agency, our marketing department. Um, I've done all the work for it and now the professionalism has to step in, which is not me. Um, I can I can do some of the background work, but the actual technology I am not able to do. So I'm hoping, but I can't say enough on how easy it makes it when you have money smart to turn to for um, all of the information that um, one may need. Um, and I'm going to be sending um, Ron the financial literacy resource guide when it is, it's in its final stage when it's completed. Okay, um, so we are moving on to our final section. Uh, Darnell, we will be doing an economic inclusion update for FDIC and closing remarks. So Darnell, take it away. Thank you, Ryan. And just as a reminder um, to the person that asked about the middle school activities, um, junior achievement and also uh, cross state uh, credit union both have um, programs for middle school students. So um, please do reach out to them. And before I give the uh, economic inclusion update, please let us know in the chat area, um, what is one thing you learned from this session today that you plan to look into further following the webinar? You can just put that in the chat. Okay. Ryan, you have a couple of slides for me. Are they up? They are up. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, real quick, we don't have a lot of time left. Um, I did note in my opening comments the FDIC's commitment to expanding economic inclusion. It's an integral part of our mission at the FDIC of maintaining stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system. And we've demonstrated this commitment through various economic inclusion opportunity areas, such as financial education and savings, um, as we're discussing today. We are committed to each of our economic inclusion areas, but as we approach the end of 2020 and plan for 2021, we want to specifically share information regarding our efforts towards expanding bank account access. Um, this important topic um, affects LMI communities throughout New Jersey and the nation. And the current pandemic has certainly emphasized the urgency of assisting people with low to moderate incomes to gain access to affordable and sustainable bank accounts. Having a bank account is, is critical um, for them to be able to receive income tax refunds, um, stimulus payments, and other types of government payments. And we want to invite all of the banks participating on the webinar today to take action and be responsive to, to the needs of low and moderate income populations and to bring them into the financial mainstream by offering affordable and sustainable accounts at your bank. So some recent announcements from the banking industry partners allow um, depository institutions a unique opportunity right now to offer affordable accounts. In October, the American Bankers Association urged thousands of bankers at its convention to offer a bank on certified account. And as part of this announcement, the ABA also noted that 20 of the national core service technical service providers have committed to make it easier for banks to offer affordable and sustainable accounts um, to expand their customer base. And you can view the release, um, press release from the ABA by clicking the link in this slide. Um, additionally, there are several FDIC resources available relating to expanding account access via affordable accounts. Um, the FDIC, as you may know, has conducted a national survey every two years for the past 10 years 
regarding unbanked households and use of financial services. And on October 15th of this year, we released the 2019 survey findings in a report called How America Banks Household Use of Banking and Financial Services. And the report is available on our website and further demonstrates the need for affordable and sustainable accounts. So we encourage you to take a look at the full report. Um, an ex ex executive summary is also available and there's a link to the survey included in this slide. Um, you can go to the next slide. So I believe there's just two slides. Yes, just two. Yes. Thank you. Um, so support within the banking industry is available to assist banks in these efforts um, to research and explore offering affordable accounts. First, there is a research available to help inform effective banking account access efforts. The Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis has released its latest report, which shows key takeaways from its analysis of bank on account activity, which displays that nearly 800,000 affordable accounts were opened in 2018, and that 75% of those accounts were new banking customers. Um, there's more information available at the link on the bottom of this slide, uh, Research Bank on National Data Hubs. And then there's also a link to learn more about how your bank can connect with consumers through a local um, bank on coalition. And lastly, as mentioned earlier, uh, 20 core technical service providers have committed to make it easier for their bank customers to offer um, affordable and sustainable accounts through technology. So um, we hope you found this information useful and that all the banks listening consider offering affordable and sustainable accounts in the very near future. And for others on the call, we hope you will share the resources mentioned with individuals in need of a safe, affordable bank account. And you can let us know in the chat area if your bank is currently offering um, one of these types of accounts, or if you'd like to know more about offering a certified bank on account, please, us, please let us know in the chat. And I tried to talk as quickly as I could. Um, uh, we are a couple of minutes over, but I do apologize. And I do hope you found the information uh, worth your time today. And now I will just turn it back over to, to, oh, actually, I'm doing the closing remarks, so no need to turn it over. So I just want to thank all of our presenters today for spending some time with us to talk about the wonderful work that you're doing um, in this space and helping to get young people to establish um, positive financial behaviors. And I want to thank all of the 100 people who signed up for this uh, webinar and joined us today. And we encourage you to be in touch with our speakers um, following the webinar today. And, and thank you so much for our, our partners at the coalition for um, partnering with us um, to host this webinar. And with that, enjoy the rest of your day and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Darnell, uh, this is Michael Drulis. Just, um, just I want to personally, on behalf of the board of directors, our chair, Kim Cole, just want to say thank you. Um, this is a great example of what happens when the practitioners in the field bring together partners together for the coalition to advance to the larger community. And uh, thank you. This is a tremendous model. We we hope to others will continue to consider the coalition uh, to bring this kind of valuable information. You brought in some phenomenal presenters, and uh, I will join you in thanking them. I think we could have done an hour on each of the presentations. So uh, please, I, I hope you would you would be okay. If anyone has questions, if they email info at njcfe.org, we'll be sure to move those questions to the right people, and we'll keep you in the loop, Darnell, on what kind of questions come through. Sounds good, Michael. Thank you. All right. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. And, and Ryan, thank you for your support through the uh, webinar of technology and moderating. Have a great Thanksgiving, everyone. Couldn't do it without you, Ryan. Oh, thank you. Have a good Thanksgiving, everyone.